having me. Um, uh, yes, it's, it's really nice to be here. So yeah, so I just want to reiterate um, uh, what Shannon was saying is that today I'll be talking about research using psilocybin therapy. Uh, it is not FDA approved. You cannot go out and prescribe this. Uh, this is, uh, and may never be. I think it probably will be rescheduled and become part of mainstream um, treatments, but you know, it's not up to me. <laughs> and it certainly isn't now. So uh, with that, let me jump in. Oh, um, okay. For first disclosures, uh, I am doing a study that's, uh, I have been the site PI for a couple of, uh, two, two industry sponsored studies. I'm also doing a trial currently that is supported by a company from Canada, Filament Health. Uh, I've done some paid consulting, but all of these uh, have been mitigated and uh, I won't be talking about any of that, the, the work that I, uh, in today's talk. So I don't think I need to make much of a case that we need new treatments for depression. Um, we really need new treatments for all mental health conditions. I don't think any of them we can be like, oh yeah, we totally cured that. I got, I think there's zero ones that we've cured, uh, but uh, unipolar depression is a, you know, is a, is a particularly um, uh, serious unmet need. Uh, just a little bit of the stats, you know, over 264 million people across the world. It's a leading cause in the top 10 by the, the WHO. Uh, people die, suicide. Um, from uh, depression, uh, causes lots of functional impairment. And our current treatments, uh, pharmacological treatments, uh, they, do, they can be life-saving for people, but lots of people don't respond. Uh, people do respond slow. We, mo almost all of them that we use have very similar mechanisms. Uh, they have side effects, which all of you are probably very aware of. And uh, basically new drug development has mostly stalled in the CNS space. Uh, big Pharma has basically gotten out of it. Uh, and so we're not getting a lot of new drugs. Uh, there, there, may, there are a couple things. Ketamine was a, was a, was a big development and some other things, but uh, you know, uh, it's not like we're getting a, lots of totally new classes of treatments. And so you know, we, we desperately need something new. Psilocybin, so you know, uh, it is the active ingredient in uh, many different closely related uh, hallucinogenic mushroom species. Uh, it's been used uh, religiously and in uh, cultural practices, indigenous people for thousands of years. This, this picture in the top uh, right here uh, is this um, cave painting from, uh, I think it's from Algeria from 7,000, 5,000 BCE. I think it's so amazing. It's the, it's the beheaded shaman. And you can see, um, along the, the skin and in the hands, the, these mushrooms, certainly looks like mushrooms, that look a lot like the hallucinogenic mushrooms. So this is pretty trippy, if you will. And you know, people have been you know, taking the time to make art about it for you know, almost maybe 9,000 years ago, which is you know, a lot. <laughs> so, um, so I think that's it's really powerful. This isn't the only one, but this is the one I like the best. When you take a, a high dose of psilocybin, you get it, the effects last for five to six hours. Um, and it's uh, this dream-like experience, this potent effect. People, it's not psychosis. People typically don't lose reality testing and the hallucinations are not like what we would traditionally think of a hallucination. People know that they're on a journey. They know that this is altered, uh, but you know, people can have visual changes, synesthesia, lots of different changes. Oh, and, and you know, we know that the, the psychedelic effects of psilocybin are predominantly through the 5-HT2A agonist, receptor agonist. So we, we do know some about the pharmacology. Um, you know, if you block the 2A uh, receptor and give someone psilocybin, it doesn't, it doesn't make them trip. So, so we know that. Um, this is just a little bit about the chemistry. We don't have to get too much into it, but that's psilocybin. It gets metabolized into psilocin, which is the active metabolite. Uh, and then you just, you know, for reference, that's what serotonin looks like. So it's, it's pretty similar to look, it's just a little different than serotonin. So, you know, it makes sense that we'd be hitting these uh, serotonin receptors. Uh, just another sort of uh, thing to keep in mind is that the clinical trials all use uh, synthetic psilocybin, so pure psilocybin, whereas the vast majority of people in the world currently and through history, <laughs> the vast, vast majority have used mushrooms. And you know, they're very similar. The mushrooms include psilocybin and the psilocybin is the main thing that gets 
people have a psychedelic experience, but there's probably other things in the mushrooms too, just like coffee and caffeine, right? Uh, so it's just important to keep in mind. Okay, so what kind of experiences do people have? This is a study uh, of healthy people or people without significant mental illness where they gave them increasing doses of psilocybin and they asked them this very uh, extensive uh, survey basically about different aspects of the experience. And what you can see is you get these visual alterations, elementary visuals of you know, seeing squiggles or you know, um, different things that are moving, synesthesia, so hearing colors, that sort of thing. Vivid, vivid imagery would maybe seeing a dragon, that would be a vivid image. And then changed meaning of percepts. So you see something, but it has a different meaning, like, oh, my hand is really important, you know, that sort of thing. And then insightfulness, religious experience, this experience of unity is something that people talk a lot about. This is, Some people describe it as a um, temporary dissolution of the self-other boundary. I know that's kind of trippy to get your head around, but the idea is that you become one with, you feel like you're one with all of humankind or maybe even the world, maybe plants or the earth. That's a common experience. A blissful state, I think that's pretty clear. Um, and anxiety, this makes it look like the anxiety is pretty mild, but it's, it's kind of like on a different scale. But people can have a fair amount of anxiety when they have these experiences. This is ketamine, just as a, as a contrast. Um, you know, this is a dissociative anesthetic that we also use as a antidepressant. Um, it has a lot of the same features, but it has a lot more of a disembodiment, which makes sense for a, dis uh, for a dissociative anesthetic. But it's kind of, I've always, this graph it's still causes a fair amount of experience of unity, which people don't usually talk about with ketamine, but it's kind of interesting. Okay, so first question that people usually ask is like, oh my gosh, you're going to be giving people these addictive drugs. What are you doing? It's going to kill people. And you know, it might, I guess. Uh, this is a graph uh, that I like though, where um, on the y-axis we have um, how likely people are to become dependent when they use the, the drug. Um, and dependent, you know, increasing their, their dose, um, becoming more and more focused on trying to get the drug. Uh, and then on the x-axis, it's the active over lethal, lethal dose. So, you know, the therapeutic dose, how, how big is that range? And you can see in the top right corner, we got heroin, so the worst, or, you know, you use it, people are very likely to develop dependence and the therapeutic window versus what will kill you is disturbingly small. Um, uh, and so you can see, you know, a lot of things are up here. I just want to point out alcohol, right? We, alcohol is legal, but it's pretty, uh, doesn't actually have a huge therapeutic window. And a lot of people become dependent on it. And we have a lot of legal um, dispensaries all over every state uh, and with very poorly trained bartenders, right? So just to say like, we, you know, it, our, our drug laws are not based on the danger of any um, drug. And you can see the psychedelics are over here and that they don't have, people do not very, very vanishingly rare will escalate their dose um, or become, you know, using it more and more. Uh, and the, the traditional uh, uh, risks, they're, 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 the, the lethal dose is kind of only theoretical. Now, if you took a very high dose, you would be unhappy <laughs> and people kind of freak out, but they don't die. It doesn't make their heart stop or um, it makes them stop breathing. Okay, uh, one, one uh, sort of important thing to think about is the micro versus macro. I put them in quotations because they're not they're not actually metric, so, it's more, so they're not really being used as a, as a like there are not nano dosing, you know, like people, people, they don't mean it like that. What, what they mean is micro dosing is when people are taking a psychedelic, say um, dried mushrooms at a sub perceptual dose. And typically when people do that, they're doing it every three days or so. Um, it, it is interesting in that, you know, traditional cultures uh, do have descriptions of using low doses of uh, psychedelic plants to have various therapeutic benefits and functional enhancements, you know, decrease appetite or being able to stay awake, that sort of thing. Um, and then the modern practice, actually, there's a, a book, <laughs> this book by James Fadiman came out and, uh, and it made, came very popular since 2011. So it doesn't have a, a, a very long history, but there are lots and lots of people who are uh, proponents of it. Uh, and then these people don't typically call it macro dosing, but I, I, I call it that because I wanted to differentiate it from micro dosing. What, this is what's actually been studied in most of the clinical trials. This is where you take a, a, a high dose and with the goal of having a, a psychedelic experience or a, some people call a full psychedelic experience. 
typically people who are doing this are not doing it more than month once a month, but typically much less frequently than that. Um, and this is what a lot of people, you know, have noticed in traditional cultures. There are many different traditions that have used high dose psychedelics uh, for various uh, purposes. You know, ayahuasca, psychedelic mushrooms, other psychedelics as well, um, mescaline, just as a couple of examples. Uh, just quickly talking about microdosing. Uh, there are lots of these observational studies where you you know you ask people, oh, do you microdose? And people are like, yes. And then they ask them a whole bunch of questions and then they ask a whole bunch of people who don't microdose. And uh, lo and, lo and you know, not so surprising, the people who believe in microdosing and know that they're microdosing say that they are better off when they're microdosing. Um, hard to know what to make of it. I guess it's some kind of information, but it's not very definitive because you know people believe in it. To, you have to be a, kind of a believer to do it. Um, there haven't been that many randomized clinical trials. There's this one trial that I think it's really <laughs> very clever. Uh, I wish I had thought of it. So, so what they did is they found people out in the world uh, who were gonna start microdosing, like just on their own. They're like, oh, are you gonna start microdosing? And the person's like, the people say, yes, I'm signing up, I want to. And, 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 and do you have your own drugs? <laughs> so like they didn't provide the drug, the person has their own drugs. And then they figured out a way to randomize people using their own drugs to, be, uh, to have a placebo or, um, uh, or, a, or a psilocybin or LSD, which is very clever. And so they got a big sample, but they don't know these people. These people are just like people from the internet, um, but they do know if they're going through the motions and scanning the different aspects. And they had, uh, this is the, the thing, they had a baseline, then people did four weeks of microdosing or placebo, and then they did an assessments uh, follow-up. And they, they had three conditions actually, placebo, half-half uh, group, and the microdose group. Um, and I don't have to get too much into it, but, but basically uh, they didn't find any differences between the groups uh, in, in the main things that they were looking at, like well-being, for example, or mindfulness or life satisfaction. When they looked at things that happened acutely, so right after they took the, the, the compound, they did find some differences uh, that you can see that in this column. Um, but they, they did a clever thing where they asked people to guess what they thought they had just gotten. Did you get a microdose or not? And what they found actually was when you modeled the guess, all those effects went away. And actually the effect was just that if you thought you got psilocybin, thought you were in the active, you know, if you thought you were in the active uh, microdosing group, then you got benefits. So it wasn't about whether or not you actually were in the microdosing group, it was whether or not you thought you were in the microdosing group. Um, so that, you know, is not that, um, you know, it kind of suggests that it doesn't have this powerful effect. So just kind of summarizing quickly about microdosing, no clinical trial evidence of its efficacy. Positive expectations likely play a large role, but actually no one's done a study in a clinical population. There's been no study of microdosing in depressed people, for example. So that those people from the internet, the, you know, they, they, they don't have a mental health problem. So what exactly, like what's the right thing to look for for a change anyway, right? Um, and, uh, you know, so I think it's still an open question. You, one could imagine, that uh, low doses of psilocybin say could be like an SSRI. I mean, it doesn't have the same mechanism, but it's affecting the serotonin receptor and you could imagine that working, but, but really there's no evidence yet one way or the other. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about microdosing. Let's switch over to macro, macrodosing. So modern psilocybin trials, so there's been several, well, there was a whole phase of research back in the 60s and 70s. Some of you may remember this. Then it got shut down for political reasons. Um, and then it's, there's been a renaissance over the last, I would say, 15 years now. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be talking about this modern time. So the modern clinical trials with high-dose psychedelics, um, it, it, the, the model is a combined psychotherapy drug um, treatment. And so the way, and, and um, even more tightly, you know, even more specifically, the therapy that goes with the drug treatment is really, there are a bunch of aspects to it, but one important thing is to sort of optimize the set and setting. That's kind of jargon. Actually, that's Tim, Timothy Leary's jargon that we're, we're, we're stuck with. Um, but what, what that means is the mindset. So what the person's intentions are, why they're doing this, and then the setting is like where they're doing it and, and how the environment is uh, set up for that. So the way this typically works, is that say in a depression trial, 
the patient comes in and meets with their therapist. It's actually kind of funny. There's this old joke that scientists would rather use each other's toothbrushes than their name, their, their nomenclature. So different groups will call this person different things. So are they a therapist? Are they a guide? Are they a sitter? You know, are they a facilitator? You know, people argue about these things. I'm going to call, well, I'm going to call them facilitators and therapists because um, I think this is psychotherapy, but some people even argue about that, but whatever. The patient with depression meets with the, their, their therapist and they do what's called preparation. So they will get to know each other, build rapport, talk about the story of the, the history of their depression, talk about psychoeducation, about what they might experience on the psychedelic, and then, um, you know, talk about sort of practical things about the dosing day, about how it's going to go and, and you know, um, where the bathroom is and how they're going to help them with the bathroom. Uh, and then also talk about what they're hoping to get out of the experience. That's typically, most studies is like six to eight hours spread over a couple sessions. Then on the dosing day, the patient comes in early in the morning and they get their pill, um, psilocybin, they take it. And then while it's kicking in, they will typically wear, um, be encouraged to wear eye shades and listen to beautiful music and be in this sort of living room setting with a with this couch. This picture has a bed, but most groups use a sort of a, a large couch that you can lay down on, uh, and then you know with a blanket uh, and uh, and and have their experience. And during that whole day, it's typically an eight-hour session. Uh, the facilitator therapist is typically sitting next to them and staying with them, and they're never left alone. Um, and sometimes if people become anxious or upset, the the facilitator will be there to help them ground themselves. But most of the experience, you know, pe people can lay there for five hours and, and not talk at all, right? And have a totally internal experience. So it really isn't, if any of you have seen things with the MDMA therapy, it's pretty different. The MDMA therapy, people are, are typically talking a fair amount. And there's a fair amount of active therapy. The dosing session with psilocybin is not typically like that. There can be some talking, but mostly the person is maybe describing what they're experiencing and the therapist is mostly listening. Uh, and then the next day, and then a couple other sessions after, there's what's called integration therapy. So now the person comes back, talks to their therapist again, and tries to make sense of what they're experiencing and try to just talk about the, if they've achieved their intention or not, and what they're changing about their life or not, um, and try to kind of put it back into their, integrate it with the rest of their lives. Um, and this, so this is the typical um, sort of package, if you will, that, that are used in these clinical trials. Uh, you know, things that people think are important for this psychedelic psychotherapy, I mentioned the preparation, the therapy is mostly pretty non-directive, right? So it's not CBT, you're not making interpretations. Um, there are these ideas about beginner's mind and inner healing capacity. Basically the idea of sort of kind of go with the flow, see how it's gonna be try to be open to this new unusual experience. Uh, music, universally thought that music's important. Uh, you know, if you ask the patients, the patients will say, oh yeah, the music was super important for my experience. People describe the music as having sort of becoming part, like coming from inside of them often or you know, blurring the, the where the music's coming from. And also um, feel like the music provides uh, some sort of substrate for their experience. I don't know, it's kind of hand wavy, but that's that's what people describe. Uh, and then integration, as I mentioned. So now I have a video. Um, this is a video of a man who participated in the one of the cancer trials from Hopkins. He has prostate cancer and he's talking about what it was like for him. And let me see here. Oh, Josh, we're actually not able to hear it. Oh. Um, if you want That's to. Weird. Oh, wait, let me uh, try again. Wait, share sound. Let me try that out. Yeah, perfect. My two guides, beautiful Great, music playing in my ears, lying in the sofa. My two guides sitting there quietly, supportively. And what it led to was a reawakening what it felt like when my first daughter Tanya died and the feelings just came flooding out 
And I was completely into the strongest sense of despair and loss that I had after she died. And I howled. And I felt comforted that my guides won't, they won't come and comfort me, they won't stop me, they'll let me go into it. And I did. And um, that sort of almost 30 years of not denial, but putting it down, suppressing how that felt. And that was very liberating. After that, the experience with the drug, it became even more potent. Everything was animate. Um, like sitting here, all of us around us, it's, it's animate. Celebrating being part of this incredible. So that just gives you um, a little bit of a sense of the kind of things people describe in these in these studies. You know, he describes this intense emotional experience, this sort of getting back to things that weren't on his mind, actually, this, this, tra this uh, grief that he'd had from a long time ago. That's a very common uh, description. Um, feeling like he's able to experience in a way that he wasn't able before. Uh, also at the end there where he's talking about feeling, you know, actually connected in maybe a metaphysical sense, like literally, but also you know, an emotional way with nature and the world. Um, and uh, yeah, and this is the kind of thing people describe and that people describe that as very therapeutic uh, often. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Ooh. Okay, so here's data from that particular trial. So this was a trial um, done at Hopkins where they took people who were dying of cancer who had um, uh, distress. Uh, they actually, people could be either depressed or anxious or even have an uh, adjustment disorder, but they measured depression and the study design actually, uh, they, they randomized people to, to either get a, a, a very low dose of psilocybin, so like a micro dose, one that they didn't expect to be so therapeutic. Um, and we can talk about why they did that in a second, but you know, they did that, or a high dose where they have that sort of experience like I was talking about in the video. And what you can see is that when you do that, you get this big decrease in depression uh, in, the act, in the high dose versus the low dose. And then you cross people over and the low dose people, the high dose people now are get a low dose and they stay not depressed. Whereas the um, people got low dose get even better uh, after the high dose and then they stay not depressed. And we'll just look at, you know, six months after the second dose. And I think there were six months between these doses. So, uh, oh no, maybe, uh, sorry, it was a month between doses. So the people who got the high dose, they're going eight, seven months um, better. And this is the kind of thing people, oh, wow, you could treat someone once and you could have this many months of improvement. Now this isn't major depression. This is people with sort of existential existential distress, but this is the kind of thing that got people excited. Uh, another thing that was in the study in Hopkins, the Hopkins group have, have done this in a couple of their studies, is they asked people how personally meaningful was the experience, which I think is, is a cool question. We don't usually ask that, um, I think. And uh, what they found was that uh, over 60% of people said that the top, that the high dose session was among the top most meaningful experiences of their entire life. Um, which, you know, I, I don't, I've never seen this data for Prozac, but I imagine that it's, it's not similar, right? <laughs> you know, uh, so that's, it's pretty powerful. Whether or not it's therapeutic, people really feel like it's meaningful, which you could see in that video, right? Uh, I'm going to skip this. Okay, so this, uh, this is another study that was done uh, back in 2016. This is treatment resistant depression. So these were very sick people. Many of them had gotten ECT, failed multiple medications. Uh, it was open label. Uh, but you, again, you can see people, their depression goes down and stays down uh, for many months after a single treatment. Here's a more modern trial that just came in the New England Journal. I really like their visual abstracts. It's pretty cool. So what they did in this study, they had almost 60 people. They got, so they ran, so it was a, a two-arm study and you, you, everyone got, um, psilocybin therapy, you know, psychedelic therapy plus the dosing sessions. And they also got a daily pill. Half the group got active psilocybin in their dosing sessions and placebo in their daily pills. And the other group got escitalopram in their daily pills and took placebo during the dosing sessions. So it was really a head to head of psilocybin versus escitalopram. 
now we can talk about many of the challenges of this, but their primary outcome uh, did not separate. It was a failed trial. That's how the paper is written. Um, however, and here's the data. So this is um, mean change. So there's no separation here in their primary outcome, which is the kid, quids, which is the self-report scale. Um, this is a uh, well-being measure, which did separate, but it was a secondary measure. Um, however, in the supplement, they, they show this. This is, <laughs> they were really kicking themselves about the, the measure they picked as their primary outcome because they had a, a lot of secondary measures and they got separation for all of them except for their primary. So, you know, they tried to, you know, uh, finesse this, <laughs> you know, because right, because like just as a clinical trial thing, you, you know, we are expected to pick, to put our nickel down. Like what is the primary outcome? What do we say is going to be a successful or not successful trial? And it's, it's good, right? Because statistically, if we don't do that, you could just put an infinite number of depression measures and pick the one that works and you'd get some just by chance. And pharma companies, big pharma have, have done that in the past. Right? So that, that this has been an evol evolution, but then you're, you get situations like this and it's hard to know exactly what to make of it. Um, uh, so yeah, so that, so, but this is the, the most recent study and you know, take it, take, take it from it what you will, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, switching gears a little bit, I kind of hinted a couple places about the challenges. This is the one and only meme that I've made. <laughs> so this is, I'm very proud of this because uh, you know, it doesn't go on your CV, but basically uh, the idea of the blind, right? So we, everyone talks about double blind studies, uh, but usually it's a double blind study, right? It's not actually blind because uh, people can tell what, what arm they're in. And with a psychedelic, certainly a high dose psychedelic, uh, it would be hard not to tell. Right, so um, that's that's a major challenge that the psychedelic field has has uh, grappled with, or is grappling with. Um, psychedelic trials are also extra hard because it's both a therapy and a drug. So it turns out psychotherapy trials are also very hard. What's a what's a placebo therapy? People argue about this. It's not totally clear. Is technically a placebo is something you put in your body that's inert. But in therapy, there is no touching typically. And so, and so it's all placebo in one way, uh, but it's not in another. And so it, it, it's, it's a very challenging thing to do. Um, and then, you know, obviously people are very excited about psychedelics. And so that also makes um, expectancies about the treatments particularly hard. Maybe a simple way of saying it is people go into the studies because they believe psychedelics work and then they can tell if they got a psychedelic or not, which is a recipe for expectancy effects, right? This is just a study from pain, just to show how powerful expectancy effects can be. Uh, they gave people um, uh, this Remy fentanyl and did this, and it was measuring its an an analgesic effect. And they had a no expectancy um, uh, condition, a positive expectancy condition where they induced the person to think that the Remy fentanyl was gonna work even better and a negative that kind of induced that they think that it isn't gonna work. And you can see that the negative expectancy totally got rid of any positive effect of the Remy fentanyl. This is, you know, fentanyl basically. Uh, whereas the positive expectancy doubled the effectiveness or even more. Uh, so it is just, it's very powerful um, expectancy effects. However, also keep, important to keep in mind that the reason we have control conditions isn't just about the placebo effect or expectancies, right? So uh, when people are in a trial and they're getting better, say an open label trial, presumably something is due to the treatment specific effect. Some of, some of it's due to the placebo or expectancy effect, but then there are all these other effects that are, that are just happen with time. Like people get better over time, typically. People go into studies when they're at their worst. Uh, actually just measuring things makes things better sometimes. So it's kind of a complicated thing. Um, and I would say that all the psychedelic trials with placebo arms are only controlling for these things, which is not nothing, but no one has successfully controlled for this, which I think is a problem. Um, people have tried different things. Uh, oh, just also to measure, mention that uh, double blind studies, even for like SSRIs have often not really been blinded. And when people test, they actually, many people can tell that they're getting the active condition often because of side effects. So it may not just be about psychedelic trials, um, but psychedelic trials are really kind of bring it to the forefront. Um, so people have tried things, uh, active placebos, they've tried niacin, different things, but no one's tried that hard. And, uh, you know, 
nothing has really been compelling as, a, as really blinding aspects of the experience. There is this one group that used that was sitting ayahuasca, which is this brew, uh, and it makes you vomit. And they actually made this like non-psychedelic brew that made people vomit. So that, that's, that was pretty compelling. <laughs> and they actually confused some people to think that they had gotten the real one. So that, that's the best case. Um, but no one is really like dextromethorphan. People have tried that, but they never tried at a high enough dose to actually make people feel altered. And there are a bunch of reasons for that. Very good reasons, but. Um, and there's some studies that are being going on right now where people are trying some things. Uh, but it's underwhelming. Uh, okay, incomplete disclosure is another thing that people can try. Here's a study that isn't published yet from a colleague of mine at Stanford. It's an amazing study. What he he's an anesthesiologist, and what he he's doing is he's taking people who are getting surgery for something else and uh, anesthetizing them either with ketamine or without, right? But it's totally blinded, so people have no experience because they're unconscious because they're they're having surgery. And what he finds is that everyone, their depression, everyone's depression gets better, but there's no difference between the groups. Just to give you a sense, you know, that expectancy can have big effects, even, right? Um, and, you know, we'll see when this paper comes out and such, but I, I think it's a very powerful thing. Ketamine, we think, is this active antidepressant, um, but something, something quirky is going on, and it probably has something to do with expectancies. I'm going to skip this just for the time. Last thing I want to talk about is a major issue with psychedelics is they're serotonergic. What about SSRIs? If they're going to be an antidepressant, what goes on with SSRIs? Can, can, you, can we use them together? The lore is that you can't. The lore is that SSRIs uh, blunt the effects of psychedelics. And so we, 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 but no one's done trials of it or anything really. So we wanted to sort of take a first step. So what we did is we, we went to Reddit to, to, to ask the people, uh, the, all the amateur psychopharmacologists who write about their psychedelic experiences. And what we did is we, we, we did a, a systematic search of Reddit comments about psychedelic mushrooms and SSRIs. And we found all the comments, we found individual non-redundant comments, and then we coded them, each comment, for whether or not the person described it as their psychedelic experience as no change or enhanced, like they had a more intense psychedelic experience or blunted, they had a less intense psychedelic experience. And you can see that on Reddit, uh, and uh, we have 421 uh, unique comments, uh, more than half of people said that when they were on an SSRI, their psilocybin experience was blunted. Here's some quotes. Recently started taking my meds off about a little over a month ago and took a four gram shroom trip this Saturday with some friends. We all took the same amount. I don't think I was tripping as hard as them, but I was definitely still tripping. In my opinion, it did not feel less euphoric than the trips I've had before. So we, we, quoted, we would code that as a less intense trip. And then here's, I've been on 10 milligrams of acetalopram for years. And the first time I dosed was 2.5 grams and similar to the experience you described. I upped the dose to four grams the next time it had a much more real trip. Now for a recreational dose, I take anywhere between three and eight grams. So maybe you just have to take more. So this person's saying that they have to up their dosage of the, of the shroom while they're on acetalopram. I, I would go for it. I've taken both shrooms and acid on three milli, 30 milligrams of Celexa and didn't know most of the difference with or without the SSRI. So this person would be coded as no change. Um, we also looked in all these comments to see if anyone said that they had anything that we could be called an adverse event. And we did find some small numbers. There was one person who reported having a seizure. Um, uh, and then uh, some people described anxiety. Uh, and uh, one person described being hospitalized and also some physical things. But you can see only 18 of 100, 421 people, which is probably the same rate of people not on SSRIs. So there doesn't seem to be any safety, particular safety concerns with SSRIs. Um, yeah, so here's some quotes. Well, um, I'm gonna skip that for now. On the other hand, so, so our Reddit study suggested, yes, SSRIs do blunt the effects of psychedelics, but there have been these two trials, which I think are really interesting. Uh, well, no, this one trial, sorry. This, uh, they took 27 people who are healthy, not mentally ill, uh, and did a within subject study where they randomized them to either get Lexapro or placebo for two weeks. And then everyone got, 25 milligrams of psilocybin, which I thought is very clever. And um, what you can see here is uh, the black circles are um, 
the people who got acetalopram and the white circles are placebo. And you can see that they're really, if you look at, just look, this is oceanic boundlessness. I forget what AED stands for. These are different aspects of the psychedelic experience. The ones that I showed you earlier with that, that um, spider plot. But you can see there's really no separation between placebo and acetalopram, except for this one, which is anxiety. So people had less anxiety when they were on acetalopram, um, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> so like, so in when you do it this way, it, people, half the people did not have blunted um, effects of the psychedelic when they were on acetalopram. Now, maybe it's because they were only in the acetalopram for two weeks. Maybe you need longer. No one knows, but uh, it's still an open question. Um, the other thing, this, these are acute drug effects. So there did seem to be some blunting of the acute, acute drug effects in the acetalopram group, but also bad drug effects in particular, but not how much they liked it, how stimulated they felt, or how much ego disillusion they had, or how high they felt. So this study kind of suggested <laughs> mixing the acetalopram and psilocybin makes the trip easy, you know, um, better, <laughs> maybe <laughs> less anxiety provoking. Okay. Um, it, it also decreased the blood pressure and heart rate changes and acute adverse events. Uh, not that they were severe, but just, you know, unpleasantness that people described after psilocybin. So let's see, we have, we have 20 minutes. I could talk about a study that we did, or we could go to questions. Is there, uh, what do people, maybe I'll we'll stop for some questions because I, I, I probably have there are lots of them. That's a great idea. Um, we did have one question in the chat so far, Deb. I'm wondering if you want to come off of mute and ask your questions that you put in there. Sure. Uh, although, although uh, Josh, you pretty much already asked it. Uh, oh. I was curious uh, whether or not the studies had made observations for persons who were non-recreational users or uh, uh, non-psychotropic uh, 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 users, and um, and you answered that. Uh, oh. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the, I mean the, the the trial that I was describing, those are people who are not users or in mental health. You know, these are, you know, yeah. Any options for to get psilocybin for an Idaho patient? Uh, so the only option for anybody in America to get psilocybin in treatment in a legal way <laughs> is to be part of a trial. And so you can look for trials in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and there are trials going on and you know, the new ones starting up all the time. Uh, I can tell you that the interest greatly exceeds the, the uh, um, supply, <laughs> right? Uh, like, you know, we're, yeah. so lots of people would like to be in these trials uh, and it's actually, it's very sad, right? Cause um, you know, we just can't provide it. Now that's appropriate because we're still doing the research but we can't do the research at the, at the speed of people who wanna, who wanna try it. Um, there are also um, there are also uh, states like Oregon that are decriminalizing it and trying to legalize it. So there are a lot of places in America that it's decriminalized, but you still still can provide it as a treatment without serious risk for your license, right? Um, uh, but there are Oregon is trying to make a, like a sort of a shadow FDA where they would have their own system for providing this as a treatment, but that hasn't happened yet. There are also places outside of America, so the Netherlands, uh, you can go, uh, and there are some places in South America, but those you're, you know, really rolling the dice, and you know, it's it's a gray zone. Um, it's not illegal in those countries, but it's not regulated well either. So, um, I, I, you know, I get to ask this question a lot, and basically, I, I, I basically say, I'm sorry, I don't, <laughs> I don't have any good recommendations for you. Um, uh, okay, other questions. Uh, are there mental health contraindications? So great question. So I have a se whole separate talk about bipolar. So we're, we're, we're just starting up a trial where we're gonna give psilocybin for de depression and people with bipolar too. Um, there is a whole debate and we really don't know, um, but there do does seem to be some risk of inducing hypomania or mania in people at risk for bipolar, um, but it, the actual risk is probably quite low. Um, so that's that's one major issue. It, it, the drug is also a sympathomimetic. So, you know, when you take it, the heart rate does go up, blood pressure does go up. 
you know, significantly, but temporarily. So that's another thing that, that you know, in our clinical trials, we're really careful about. So like people have to have low, low enough blood pressures. They can't have, you know, it's like a stress test is how we think about it. Um, there are a lot of medications that are contraindicated, though most of those are more for the clinical trialist <laughs> than the participant. Like we, we don't think that mixing SSRIs and psilocybin, for example, is dangerous, but if it blunted the effects, as a clinical trialist, you don't want you don't want that in your clinical trial. But that's not for the patients, you know. Um, but there are some that are probably dangerous. So like lithium, there's a, a study. Uh, again, uh, someone else, uh, the Hopkins group did a study where they looked at Reddit, and they found that actually people who were combining um, LSC or psilocybin with with lithium had very high rates of severe adverse events, including a lot of seizures, which was concerning. Um, yeah. So those are the main ones I can think of. You know, there's this whole other question about like the adverse events of these things. I said that these drugs are safe in the sense that you know you don't your heart doesn't stop, and, but they are profound and they do cause people to change. And you know, it's kind of like risks of very intense psychotherapy is one way to think about it. Like people, but it's even more so. Like there's evidence now that that you can have belief change directional belief change towards non-material beliefs. That's a study that just came out. Um, it's a survey study, but it, it does suggest that people become more, believe more in non-material explanations. So speaking with dead people, ghosts, that sort of thing. Uh, you, you actually, you heard a little bit in the, in the video where the guy feels like that, they're, that everything's alive. That's panpsychism is another thing that people describe. Is that an adverse event? The patients never complain about it. <laughs> they see it as a positive, just like he did. But uh, observer might, some observers might think it's an adverse event. Um, psychedelic efficacy with PTSD. Right, great question. I, I also work at the, I work at the San Francisco VA. So this is something I'm, I really care a lot about. Uh, the study that I was gonna tell you about, but I don't have time. We, we have a little bit of data there that can help with, with PTSD. Um, certainly the anecdotal reports and even that video I showed you, he's talking not about PTSD exactly, but about trauma from a long time ago that he's able to reprocess. So there is a whole sort of theoretical reason why it would be helpful for PTSD. It hasn't really been studied though, which is a little bit surprising, but uh, I can tell you a lot of it is because a lot of the oxygen in the room, so to speak, was taken up by MAPS and MDMA therapy for PTSD. So there's been a lot of work about MDMA therapy for PTSD and very little or no research about P uh, psilocybin for PTSD, even though psilocybin for PTSD might also work. Um, so that's something we really want to do. Um, okay. Oh, and my screen share. Sorry. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Josh, I think we had um, another question from Dr. Crownover. Uh, he asked, any guidance on how to help a patient find a safe dose when using recreationally? Oh, I, I, yeah, I missed that. That's a great question. Uh, no, I mean, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> the, the problem is that the mushrooms are highly variable, right? Um, and so even, even within one mushroom, different parts of the mushroom have very different concentrations of psilocybin. Uh, and that's why you don't see any clinical trials using actual mushrooms because it's not standardized. It's very difficult to standardize. So, so no, I don't really have any guidance on how to, how to figure it out. And, you know, People talk about the dreaded underdose, you know, when they go and they didn't, they didn't get enough, right? But you, of course, you also have the other thing that people describe of, of taking too much, uh, and it was more than they wanted. Um, and so, no, I don't know. I don't know how to recommend people fig figure out a safe dose. Um, you know, as a psychopharmacologist, I'd be like, well, you should start, start slow and go low, you know, start low and go slow, but, but that's not what people typically do. So I, I, I don't know. And, and of course it also doesn't help because if you have one batch and you do that and then you get a different batch, it could be totally different. So um, I think that's a, that's a problem with the, the nat naturally sourced uh, psilocybin. Other questions, other things people wanna know about? Thank yeah, you so Oh, go ahead, Tara. Well, I was just, um... I was just going to ask, I, I don't think you mentioned it, um, but the last talk, we had a talk, I think last year, um, about this, and she talked a lot about um, therapy for addiction, like nicotine and alcohol, and I didn't know if there was an update on that or whether you had any thoughts on that. Oh, yeah, uh, great question. Um, 
yeah, this talk, I was trying to just focus on uh, depression. Um, as I said, I have a separate talk about, I have two separate talks uh, about uh, addiction and about bipolar depression. Uh, yes, there is, um, there is work uh, about addiction. So Hopkins has done work with nicotine and they're actually doing a, a NIDA funded clinical trial of psilocybin oh. therapy for uh, nicotine addiction. Uh, they have, you know, their studies, they, they don't have placebo control trial. They did an open label trial of, of, of people who had failed smoking cessation multiple times. And they had pretty compelling evidence that people stopped smoking. Um, and then there's the, the NYU group uh, is doing work with alcohol and they, they just published a placebo control trial. Now the placebo controlled, like the people in the placebo knew that they, they were in the placebo, but still the people in the active arm were severe alcoholics and then were able to cut down on their drinking in ways that you know, was pretty dramatic. So yeah, there, there is interest in this. And I think there is a, there is a uh, promising data. Mm -hmm. You know, people ask like, how does it work? <laughs> you know, right? Like, what, how is it working? And that's a big mystery. Uh, you know, I think we can talk about the edges and, you know, I've, I've kind of been focusing on the psychological mechanisms. Like people feel like they, you know, can feel freer and stuff. And there's a whole bunch of work in animals and, you know, it turns out psilocybin can have antidepressant like effects in rodents. So presumably they're not having this sort of transformative psychological experience though. I don't know, you know, um, but one organizing um, hypothesis, hypothesis is that what these drugs do is they induce a like sort of plastic state or a, a, a time where like a reset or you know, people use different kind of words for it, but the idea to allow people to change things about themselves, change long-standing patterns of thought and behavior. That's, that's, I would say the working model at the moment for most psychedelic researchers that, you know, and, and if you think about that, if that was really possible to do, you could see how, why, why it might be helpful for almost all of our mental, all of our illnesses, right? <laughs> because addiction, you know, you get to get into this particular rut, behavioral rut, right? You keep doing the thing and you, you may not, you may know, or you often do know you should stop, but you can't, right? And then co depression, you could think of like the, the cognitive patterns and you know that you probably should stop, but you can't. And, you know, OCD and anorexia and um, other things too. Uh, yeah, so, so that's the working model. Um, uh, and so, yeah, uh, we're doing a study. We haven't dosed anyone, but we're doing a study of psilocybin for um, methamphetamine use disorder. We're gonna be doing cool. a pilot study in the spring, um, you know, uh, mostly because you pick things that we have almost no treatments for <laughs> that are really bad. And, it, you know, uh, then maybe if you can show some movement, that would be really exciting. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Other, Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I had one question. Uh, this is Steven, the pharmacist. Like, uh, I just wanted to give you a, a minute to talk about, like, what's the biggest misconception regarding safety and or use either perpetuated by the media or that you find yourself being, oh, how do I, how do I correct that misinformation? <laughs> oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, it's a really good question. And I, I, I get it from both sides. I, you know, the, the, the circles that I, I, I run in, you know, in the psychedelic, you go to a psychedelic research conference, right? And, <laughs> and you'll get a lot of people, uh, also industry, industry has gotten into this, who will say things like psilocybin is going to cure war, <laughs> right? You hear stuff like that. <laughs> or even uh, some major leaders in the field recently said, you know, MDMA will allow us to get to trauma zero, whatever that means, right? So things like that. And you're like, oh boy, um, no. <laughs> or, or psychedelics will cure climate change. You know, like if we could just get enough people to get there. You know, and so, so that, that is hard for me. Yeah. So that's something I deal with a lot, like, oh my gosh, you know, and, and then also a lot of stuff that we grapple with, with like how little we know, you know, like you'll have a lot of people uh, who will say, you know, it has to be done this way. This is the way it's done. It has to be done this way. Like, for example, even I, I kind of glossed over this a little bit, but I was telling you about that, th that psychotherapy model in all the trials that have been done, it's actually two therapists for the prep dosing and integration. And then you try and figure out like, why is it? Why did we have that? <laughs> why is it this? And typically it has been a male and female therapist. It had to be a male and female. And you get sort of different answers. Um, 
And there is a practical thing, which is like eight hours. You can't leave the person alone, right? You have to take them to the bathroom. You know, that, that's a practical thing. But it turns out there's also a whole rationale. There, there are two other reasons. One is the idea of sort of a psychoanalytic idea that you have to have a male and female um, energy in the room to have the transference play out. Uh, but people don't usually come out and say that, they kind of just imply it. And then the other one is to prevent boundary violations, um, which, you know, might work, <laughs> but it's kind of disturbing that that would be the plan. And, you know, it's not really advertised that way. So, so there are these things that we're being that handed down and that's psychedelic therapy also isn't unique in this way, like regular therapy, we can't do a clinical trial in every aspect of it. And so there are these things that people learn in the community and sort of figure out, uh, and so that's where we're at. On the other side, now I live in San Francisco. It doesn't come up that much, but <laughs> but there are there is the other side, which is like this has no pos no use. We shouldn't be studying it. It's totally stupid and dangerous. And we did this before, and people are going to get out of control. And what are you doing with your career? I get that too. <laughs> less less now that you know the funding has gotten better. But <laughs> it's, it's been right better. And the way I answer that is I say, you know, our treatments are so poor. And we know this gets into the brain and has effects. We need to study it. So that's that's my my position. And um, you know, I, what I bring to the table in this field is that I'm not a true believer. I've never been to Burning Man. I'm a biological psychiatrist, and I want to see if it works. And I, I really am dedicated to figuring that out. And if it does work, which aspects are the critical aspects? Because you know, it, it would be a suppose it works, but all the psychotherapy isn't needed. That would be it. That would be a horrible uh, mistake on our part. A huge amount of wasted resources and time. Now, I think the psychotherapy is probably important uh, for various reasons, but that's the sort of thing. Like, you know, yeah. So that, uh, sorry, I kind of rambled there a little bit, but that, that's what I think about that. But, and the hype is so high, uh, it, it does give one pause. Right? I mean, it was so it was so negative before, and now it's so positive that you know it's kind of like a split. Oh, I've got to find a middle ground. I can't possibly be as good or as terrible as people say. Thanks, uh, Josh. I, uh, Jeremy, I know you have a question here, but I'm going to let you kind of have the last word because I want to cover this one question that was asked in the chat um, from Mike McIsaac. He said, is there any correlation between these studies that you talked about and the LSD experiments performed at Wayne State University in the 1960s? I don't know exactly which experiments you're talking about at Wayne State, but there were lots of experiments with LSD and psilocybin back in the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, people were you doing a lot of studies in alcohol, for example, and there were a lot of studies for depression. And now the problem is that the clinical trial sort of paradigms or uh, reporting guidelines or, you know, sort of meth methodologies were, were not as strong back then. So looking at those studies, it's hard to know exactly what happened. Like, you know, I was just looking at one study where they took they took family members, first degree family members of someone with schizophrenia and gave them LSD, right? And they say that the family members had pathological responses to the LSD. Very interesting finding, but they don't tell you how many people specifically they actually dosed. They don't give you any numbers of what their responses were. So it's very difficult to know, you know, they just kind of give you a couple of qualitative things. So uh, yes, I would say that, that most, uh, psychedelic research think that we've kind of picked up the um, the the mantle, the torch from back then, but what we really learned from back then is actually surprising little, which is kind of depressing. Um, okay. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. I hope uh, you, I answered all the questions that you wanted. Um, yeah, and, uh, I, I, Jeremy, I'll just give you last thought here, and then we'll close out. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Woolley. But I, I'm curious about, um, did, did the outcome ever change based on who the therapist was or who the therapists were? Like, did different, different people produce different outcomes based on what they were like as the guides? No one is, it's a difficult thing to study. We don't know. Like, all the trials try to make it seem like everyone's interchangeable. <laughs> you know, like no one is, no one has tried to study that at that level. And and it would be hard. It would be hard to do. But I, I think that's a really important question. And and you know, it, 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 regular psychotherapy has this challenge too, like the, the dodo effect, right? Like how to prove that like a more 
a better trained therapist or someone with more years is actually better is actually surprisingly hard. Um, so I think that's a that's a really uh, important question that I don't have a good answer to. <laughs> awesome.